Hi, my name is Michał Dominiak. I work at Nokia Networks. And today I'd like to tell you something about how I do parsers and why I like doing them by hand uh, without parser generators and so on. Uh, hopefully there will not be any category theory discussion this time, so let's go. Uh, this is not, this is not, a, okay. So what is a grammar? A grammar is a set of rules uh, in a formal language that defi that tells us how to uh, interpret a, a string of characters or any other tokens. Uh, and a, a production rule is something that specifies a, a substitution for a rule. And uh, I'm going to use uh, a slightly custom version of the BNF for this presentation. Uh, I think it's the most readable one to present what I want. So this is, a, this is an example grammar. So we have two rules, one that generates a digit, which might be e either zero or one or two or and so on. And we have a number. That's basically a sequence of one or more digits. Uh, so the starter means basically the same as in regular expressions, so zero or more. And there is no special way to specify a, a sequence of uh, tokens or rules. Uh, okay, so, so something slightly more complicated might look like this. Uh, where uh, can, can, it, can it be seen over there? Okay. Uh, no. So this here is a uh, is an actual parent, and this is a uh, way to group tokens. I hope that's distinguishable enough to be seen. So this is how we specify our grammar. We have a set pro of production rules. Uh, we have some, some of them are terminals, which means they, uh, they, are, they consist, well, the terminal is uh, a fal final symbol in the language. So some, something uh, basic, some, something uh, that doesn't expand to more rules. And we have non-terminals, so the rest of the rules. Okay, so I, uh, there's this guy called Noam Komsky. I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, he's a linguist, linguist, and he created a, a hierarchy of grammars. So there is there are grammars of type zero which are unrestricted in any way, and this is, this is the category into which a uh, natural languages fall into. Uh, we have context-sensitive grammars, uh, and C and C++ are good examples of context, have, have grammars that are good examples of context-sensitive grammars. Uh, for, because, for example, when you have A star B as a statement, you cannot, without the context, the semantic context, you cannot tell whether it's declaring a variable called B that's a pointer to A, or you are trying to multiply A and B. Uh, there is type two, that's context-free grammars. This is the one that we like because it's easy to parse. Uh, and this is the one we, I will try to focus today. So. Within this category, uh, there is two kinds of grammars or parsers. Uh, the K in the parents means look ahead. So if K is one, then we can make all the decisions we need for parsing by just looking at the next uh, token in the input sequence. Uh, if it's higher, then we have to look at more to parse, uh, to, uh, parse some production rules. Uh, a special case is a star instead of K, which means that we can figure this out, but we have to look forward 
and unspecified uh, amount of times. And there's regular grammars. Uh, those are simpler than context-free grammars and cannot parse as much, so type two is going to be the one we will be focus focusing on. So there is different strategies for parsing. So there is bottom-up parsers which start from tokens. And depending on the token they see, they uh, go further and look at other token tokens and based on that determine which production rule we are try we are encountering. And all our grammars are one example of those. Yeah. There's also top-down parsers which start from actual production rules and try to match them. And so logically they go from the top level of the grammar specification to the to the very bottom one uh, of terminals. And that's all LL grammars and this is the ones that are nice to write by hand. And so some people for some grammars use parser generators uh, which are nice when the grammar is simple. Uh, although they typically produce table-based parsers, so if you are trying to figure out what's actually going on inside the parser, uh, it's nearly impossible. Uh, and so like most of the generated code, it's not very good. <laughs> it's not code that you would write yourself. And if you encounter an actual pro problem inside, then it can take a while to find out what's the, what the problem is. Uh, and I'm counting Spirit, Boost Spirit, as a parser generator. Uh, how many of you had to debug a, a problem inside Spirit that was very subtle? So you know the pain. <laughs> OK. Uh, Another approach is to write a recursive descent parser. parser. So it's a parser that goes from top to bottom, tries, uh, tries the rules, and based on that goes further and further and further. And it's very simple to implement for LL grammars. You just look ahead and based on that follow with, uh, with other uh, production rules. And for more complex grammars, it's quite easy to uh, implement parsers with backtracking when writing a recursive descent parsers, parser. So backtracking means that we save, basically that we save one place where we cannot determine what's going on next. We try to parse the first rule. If that fails, we try the, from the second place, we try the the other rule that potentially matches, and it is uh, it composes very nicely when you have well defined uh, parsing functions. All right, let's go on to some ways to define abstract syntax syntax trees. So, uh, abstract syntax tree is a data structure that is tree like. Uh, that uh, is used to store the uh, result of the parsing. So every node usually uh, corresponds to a production rule and contains of the t all the tokens that are necessary to later do something with uh, the language we've parsed. So there is a few approaches to do this. Uh, I think the two most frequent are type erased ASTs and uh, statically typed ASTs. Those are my names. I, I, I'll try to explain what I mean. So you can have an AST where every node is polymorphic. And it's easy to extend them later. We've just inherited from the appropriate class and implement all the functions and you are, you are good to go. And you basically have to use virtual di virtual dispatch for visitation of the AST. Or you can use something more 
clever that implements it by hand. So uh, the first appro approach with virtual functions uh, doesn't really scale, scale very well for visitation, at least. Uh, because in this case, we are trying to visit the node. And so the visitor has to have a function that takes an assignment. Because otherwise, it doesn't work. So every visitor that we are trying to use has to, uh, in this case, contain every, be able to visit every kind of node in the AST, or at least in the subset of AST we are visiting. Uh, so it's not so easy to extend because every time you have to get add and if every time you add a new, new kind of a expression in this example you have to add, add a new function a new virtual function to the visitor uh, or a non virtual function to the visitor actually yeah either way there is another way to visit uh ASTs that are based on uh, inheritance and polymorphism. Uh, so standard type index is a way to identify a type at runtime. Uh, what this code does, it, it here, it kind of adds a uh, function pointer to a vtable we are constructing by hand. Uh, this is easier to uh, to extend, and w uh, basically we can add individu individual functions, register individual functions for visitation. Uh, but this is not very nice code, right? How many of you like this approach? Okay, <laughs> so. I prefer static ASTs. They have, of course, their own problems. So it's hard. every time you add a new kind of exp a, a new production rule that uh, can be invoked from expression. So every every new kind of an expression will require you to recompile everything that requires an expression. Uh, but you get nice type checking, and we are going to use a variant class. So we have an expression that might be either an assignment, either a binary expression, or a function call. This is a very simple example. So a uh, fmap is basically is something you could call you could also call visit. So uh, and make overload set is a neat trick that relies on the fact that lambdas are exp that lambdas are implemented as structures in the language that have an overloaded operator call. So what this does is basically inherits from all the lambdas over here. And then using the using operator call statement, you get a uh, function object that can be called with, uh, as that has all of these as the overloads of its operator call. I, uh, so we have a function that is callable with every element of the variant, and we visit the variant with it, and everything works magically. We don't have to do any uh, additional dynamic casts. We don't have to uh, do the type checking ourselves, which is very nice. But again, it's, it's static, so it requires recompilation. It's not easy to extend the AST with plugins, for example. So. It basically depends on the u on the exact use case you have for the AST. I believe either way is correct. Uh, I like this one more. Uh, yes. Um, it doesn't seem to scale quite well, does it? Yeah. Uh, the question is, it doesn't seem to scale. What do you mean? Like um, for every expression, you have to extend the variance, so it will get like three hundred bigger than a problem, and, and then you have to add like. Uh, so the question is, uh, okay, so the concern is that the variant will get bigger and the, and the overload set will get bigger, yes. 
Yeah, the second the second comment is correct. I I don't know what you mean by bigger in the case of variant. No, I I, I mean just like um, you will have a variant. Of uh, yes. Okay. So so uh, yes, it will be a variant of more types. Yes. Uh, so if your grammar has a production rule that is a alternative of twenty production rules. I'm not sure if that's a grammar or I like. It's very, the grammar is very wide. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's a use case for that, but uh, you, uh, you're not going to have a lot of code inside there. You're probably most of the time you are going to dispatch to some function that will do something else with this type. So you can consider this to be like uh, just a dispatching function for uh, something else. Okay, variant will have more types inside, but that's okay, right? It's maybe 20 line of lines of code instead of five. That's okay. What is the concern with the size of the overload set? So if you were trying to do a lot of stuff inside those lambdas, and you had a lot of them, you would have to have a lot of them in here or somewhere around. They would be, you, you would have to couple every, uh, everything you are trying to do inside the visitation into a function that analyzes an expression. So if you had a function call and you didn't want to dispatch into another function, you would have to analyze the function call here, which uh, is it a compile time uh, concern? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, it's okay. So if you have, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it is pattern matching. Yes, it's exactly pattern matching. So uh, there, uh, I don't believe the concern is of the compile time. It's I believe it's more of uh, the size of code. So I prefer my files to be like. 200 lines long, including the license handler. <laughs> I, I, I have some files that are, what? Yes, and finding the actual thing you are trying to find would be harder. So in the, if you didn't structure the code correctly to actually dispatch here, uh, you would have a, a file called expression.cpp or whatever that would analyze every kind of expression in, in your language which is not a very good way to structure code inside files. Yes? <coughs> yeah, the question is, can I merge multiple overload sets? Yes, of course. So, so files, yes, so the comment is that uh, we could be dividing this into multiple files, but generating overload sets in, in many of them. Uh, kind of yes, but it's, it's kind of awkward in C++. Because th those are objects, not types. So this is an object. Uh, the way this works is basically that the result of the make overload set is a structure. So we can, you can inherit from it, and you can uh, use using operator call to import those uh, those functions as it as overloads of its uh, operator call. Oh. All right. Let's go to something else. I won't get into much detail here. Uh, I can show you how I do it, but it's not really interesting, I think. So, lexers are meant to simplify parsers and grammars. So, uh, you don't want to uh, embed the rules for a digit or a number inside the parser. You want them to be done a step earlier. So. Uh, and you don't want to deal with uh, encodings in the parser. You want to have a single encoding coming into the parser. It's probably going to be uh, UTF-32. That's the way I do it. We can discuss whether that's correct or not after the talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to it if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this is kind of similar to the first point because uh, 
you don't want to be comparing a lot of strings inside your parser. Ideally, you're, you want to compare integer values, basically enum values, which define the type of token you are wor working with, uh, because that's much simpler, that's faster. So we want to convert strings into something that is uh, more easily comparable. Uh, there's basically two ways to do this. So you can use lexer generators. There are a lot of them. I was somebody a while ago showed me a uh, nice parser, uh, nice lexer generator that, that basically allowed you to uh, define the regular regular expressions inside a template for a C++ file. I couldn't find the name of that. It was very nice. Yes. Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, that m yeah, that might be it. Uh, please remind me about this after the talk. And there is always something that they do, so you cannot really specify everything you would like. You could like to specify for the format of a token. Uh, this is a problem with every third part party library you are using, right? This is not very different. So if you are lexing by hand, first you don't have to deal with regular expressions. You don't have to pull in the entire regular expressions engine if you are not using some features of it. Uh, though you basically have to, to implement a parser that operates on characters instead of uh, on tokens, but it's, it's not very hard. Your le your lexers are usually quite simple, even even for C plus plus. Uh, so here's how I like to s do some stuff, and this is one thing that I believe is quite nice that you can specify handling of positions in any way you want. So you can, uh, when you encounter a new line, you can just go to a new line or do something else with it. So you are not bound by whatever is specified by the, uh, by the lexer generator. And uh, hopefully the blue is visible. Uh, so uh, this is the definition of all the token types that are in a grammar that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So I basically have identifiers, then some symbols, then strings. It's a very simple grammar. And the token itself, of course, contains the type, contains the, contains the original string that was called by, by the lexer and contains the information about where it was. So where it started, when, where it ended. Uh, this standard string file should probably be a reference to something for performance concerns. Yes? Is, is offset redundant with line and column? Or is no, it right? isn't. So you don't know at which column in a line you have the, your line feed. So offset is literally the offset into the file. And line and column are, yes. The, the offset is useful and for programming reasons and line and column is useful for uh, error reporting reasons. Right, so basically. each character you'll increment offset once or you'll increment one of line and column, is that true? No, I always increment oh. offset. Yeah, I always increment offset, and I either increment the column or reset the column and increment the line. Okay. Yeah. So uh, iterators, iterators are very nice for parsing. This may be a controversial statement. I don't know. <laughs> I like them because they allow a cool, uh, allow cool things. So. 
a, uh, I don't like putting my parsers inside a class that contains all the state. And it should be easy to see in a moment why I don't, I don't like that. Uh, so basically, I have three functions, and I have something that I pass around everywhere. Uh, it usually like, looks like something like this. So I have an iterator from the Luxor, but two iterators from the Luxor. Uh, in one case, uh, I have an operator stack because I'm parsing binary expressions, so I want to know what what was the last operator I encountered to be able to compare the priorities, uh, like, uh, no, uh, what's the word? Uh, precedence. And to see whether stuff is uh, left or right as, uh, as associative. Uh, so basically, you can put everywhere, anything here, as long as, as it's not very costly to copy. For reasons we will see in a moment. A vector can be costly co to copy, but I'm not expecting a uh, very deeply nested binary expression, so I don't think that that is an actual concern here. So there is some stuff that makes life very easy. And this is the primary thing I use to get tokens. So I'm expecting that I'm going to see this token here. And if I'm not seeing it, I'm throwing an exception. This is kind of simplified. Uh, normally, there's two different throws, depending on whether I saw something else or the end of the file. Uh, the move here might look kind of weird. And if you have a parser with a uh, backtracking, uh, don't do this because you will lose your tokens and you don't want to that uh, don't want that yeah uh, there's peak which allows us to do a look ahead so basically we look at the yes yeah yeah uh, there is no return value optimization here if there isn't a move here. <coughs> so, uh, because uh, because this this is this isn't a local variable. It's something pointed to by an iterator inside the context, so I have to move it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so you want to look what is the next token sometimes. You get an optional reference. Some people say that this should be a pointer, but I don't believe that. Yes? What is none defined as? Uh, uh, null opt. None is basically a null opt. It's an, a value of an optional that's empty, that's not engaged. Sorry for using non-standard terms. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just copying my actual code to, into here. So. No, Okay, yeah. So if we are not at the end, we just see what it is, and if we are at the, at the end, we, are, we don't get anything. Uh, so there's another form of this function that is very useful. So basically we pick to see whether the next token is, is of the type specified as the second argument. Uh, so this is look ahead of k tokens. I, uh, this can be written differently with standard distance and standard advance, but not for all iterators. So standard distance won't work for uh, forward iterators? No, input iterators. Yeah. This is kind of more general. Again, uh, this is a, a, a example from a concrete place where I had concrete constraints on what I'm doing. 
All right, so let's go to the first problem we encounter. This is an example grammar. We have an expression that's various kinds of expressions, maybe 20 of them. <laughs> uh, and there's a tuple expression. That's one of the expressions. So basically, it's a language that has tuple support. So a tuple is a, uh, a uh, there shouldn't be those commas there. I screwed up this slide. OK, so a tuple is a uh, list of expressions uh, inside brackets. I actually, the first one should also be optional. Uh, either way, the problem is we have two rules uh, that start with a brace. <coughs> And it's not trivial because of the recursion that's going on everywhere around here. So a statement may be an expression. So we can have a tuple expression there. Or we can have a block instead of statement. And inside we can have a statement or a block. So either way, we can have a brace. So it's not possible. I don't think it's possible to actually solve this with look ahead in a sensible manner. Uh, so this is how this might look like. We have a block inside, we have a tuple expression. That's also a statement. Uh, and this is basically the reason why I like iterators for parsing. <laughs> because you can do this. Uh, it says parse expression on the top. So we try to parse a statement. So we do not want to hard error on a statement. We try to parse it. So we expect it might be a statement. And what is going on here? We copy the context. Then we work on the copy. If we are successful, so if all those, if we co could parse an expression and then there was a semicolon, then we know that this was a statement. So we just switch the context around. We set the copy of the context to be the actual one, and we return. And otherwise, if anything here went wrong, so if parse expression couldn't parse ex an expression, or if the next token wasn't a semicolon, we get, ex we get an exception. So we know that this was not a statement. So we can just return nothing. And then we can do this. So we are trying to, we are parsing a block. So we expect that there is an open, that, uh, there is a return statement missing from this block of code. Either way, I, uh, we expect that an open brace. At the end, we expect the close bra closing brace. And inside, until we see a closing brace, we first try to parse a statement. If that was successful, we add the statement to the block. Otherwise, we parse a block and, that, that, and add that as an element of the block. Is this understood? OK. Let's go to something concrete. Uh, I'm trying to make a build system of my dreams. So I need a language that will be nice and will solve all the problems of, of the world. Uh, it's supposed to be simple. It's supposed to be extensible in a way. Uh, so this is how it, a, a file might look like. So we have some GCC flags. So this, this is an assignment. All of these are, are assignments. Uh, every piece of the language of the la description language is an assignment, and you don't care about the order of the assignments, and you cannot change something once you assign an anything to it. Uh, so we have a string. We have a string. We have a string. More strings. We have an ID expression. So basically, a uh, dot separated list of identifiers. 
Uh, we have something I call instantiation. So executable is supposed to be a type, although it can also, in the implementation, can also be a function that returns something else, whatever. It creates an executable that contains files, which are defined over here, and a library that's called some library. And this is an expression. We can add two variables together and get all the files matched by all the globes. Okay, so here's the here's a part of the grammar. A string is anything inside double quotes. A identifier is a string without quotes, <laughs> or rather, alphanumeric string without quotes. Uh, ID expression is, as, as I said, a uh, dot separated list of identifiers. So basically, you have namespaces. And instantiation is like a function call. So there might be some arguments, comma separated, that are expressions. And we have an ID expression that identifies the type we are instantiating. Uh, actually, this grammar was broken uh, a few days ago because it contained left recursion. Because this wasn't this at the top wasn't a simple expression. It was an expression that could also uh, contain this rule, and it worked by the virtue of writing the parser by hand, you can make this work. By looking ahead, after, after parsing an expression, you could look ahead, see a uh, operator, and parse something else. But this is, this is a simpler version of the grammar. It doesn't contain any left recursion, as far as I can tell. Uh, so we have an assignment that's basically, you assign an expression to an ID expression. And an expression, uh, you have simple expressions, and you can add them together or subtract them. There is no, there is no uh, operator precedence. There is no parents around expressions to make it exist, just to make the language as simple as possible. This makes the uh, type for expression a little weird, but we can work with that. So. Mm -hmm. Just to make all of this fit on slides, I'm going to ignore the positions of everything. Uh, all of these have a uh, range type member. So all of these uh, contain the information about where they are from the fir their first token to their last one. <coughs> so we have a string. That's basically just a token. We have a uh, identifier, which is also just a token. We have an ID expression, which is a list of identifiers. We have an expression. So instantiation is an ID expression followed by a parent, followed by a list of ex expressions, followed by a parent. Simple enough. And simple expressions are just a variant of those three. And expression, we can have two operations addition and subtraction. We have an operation type that we just throw into a vector. Does this make sense? Okay. And we have an assignment, simple enough. So it's a very simple AST that basically literally represents the grammar, which is very nice. And, uh, I like the fact that all of those are values and not, and not pointers or some other weird things. I have an AST that I can do everything I could do with a value with. That was a weird statement. Uh, I like this. I like this very much. Let's try to parse the entire thing. So, uh, can you see it? The function names? Okay. Uh, so we parse a string, which is basically we want a string token. We parse an identifier, same story. We parse an ID expression, so we, ex we want an identifier, and then as long as we see a dot, we first want a dot, and then we want an identifier. 
and we don't uh, uh, yeah. and then we return the thing there's uh, just the fact that in the uh, in the real code there is the handling of uh, position information makes the last line not fit on the slide, which is not very nice. Right, let's try to parse a simple expression. We want we want something. That's the first thing. And we want to switch on the type of that thing. So it's, if it's a string, we just return a string. That's simple enough. If it's an uh, identifier, well, there is a lot of stuff to do in that case. And if there is something else, we wanted an expression, not something else. So there's cl clearly a user error. So we just throw. OK, so this is. This is the thing that goes into the place of the comment. It's a lot of code. So uh, basically, when we have an identifier, we know that the next thing is an ID expression. Because it's either just an ID expression, which aliases the value with a different name when used in this statement, or, uh, or is an instantiation. So we first parse an ID expression. If the next thing is an open parent, we parse an instantiation. So we expect the open parent, then we uh, par when then we get all the expressions that are inside the parents, uh, separated with commas. Then we want the close. Oh, uh, oh yeah. The reason that the close variable exists is because I want to get the position information from it. I literally took my own code and removed the parts that are, are to do with uh, positions, but I seem to have forgotten this one. Uh, and otherwise, if there was no open power and we just returned the ID expression. And we want to parse an expression. So we know that there is a simple expression coming. So we parse that. Uh, then if there is a plus or a minus, we know there is more of them coming. So we parse operations, which is on the next slide. Otherwise, we just move an expression that contains just this. Otherwise, we return an expression that is just a simple expression. And parse operations. Uh, I hope this is simple enough. So as long as there is something and that something is either a plus or a minus, we parse this stuff. Uh, this should say subtraction. 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 Yeah. Uh, I'm not good at naming. And we just return the operations. And this is the case where if I moved, it would be a pessimization. And Clang was so nice to tell me that. <laughs> All right. And we want to parse an assignment. So basically, we want an ID expression. Then we want the equal sign. And then we want an expression. So it's a and to parse the program, we just run parse expression in a loop for as long as there's something left in the stream of tokens we are parsing. So there is some recursion. There is value semantics. There is some throw operations. So everything is not littered with checking whether stuff actually parsed, which I think is very nice. Any questions to this? Okay, so there is, there is a thing with this. I, uh, there is some code that looks like it could be generalized in here. 
like this. Right? I'm going to have a uh, dot separator list of stuff. At some point, I might have a uh, comma separator list of stuff. Oh, hey, I do. I do have that over uh, here. Right? Yeah. So there is some generalization possible. And it's called parser combinators. So those are higher level functions. So they, are, they take functions and return other functions. And basically spirit key operators implementing the idea of expression templates are parser combinators. They take parsers and spit out another parser that does something more complex. And they help reduce code duplication, although sometimes the code might get slightly less efficient. Because over he here, I wasn't just waiting until I, exp I not see a comma anywhere, uh, anymore. I was waiting until I see a close parent, which might be an optimization of one comparison. But for a big parser, yeah, that parses a big f input, this might potentially be a concern. Uh, okay, there we go. So this is a list separated by separator. Uh, so I did not actually compile this or the code on the next slide. So if you find a bug, please raise your hand. So F is the parser we are combining with itself in this case. Uh, make vector is a helper function that's supposed to make a vector of the proper type using type detection. I, I didn't want to have standard vector of decal type F context, which is not nice. So as long as we see the thing we want to see, we consume it, and then we push back the thing into the vector, and then we return the vector. That's the function that's returned from this function. Optional. There might be something like this. So if it parses, great. We just return the value wrapped into an optional. If there isn't, oh well, we return nothing. I, uh, so I like exceptions <laughs> because they allow you to write this. Uh, there is some approaches that make the uh, parse function return a boolean and like take an output, iter uh, output argument, which is not very nice. Uh, uh, otherwise you might make your code littered with uh, like making all the parsing functions return an optional or an expected, <coughs> which is not as nice as this. This propagates from the very bottom automatically. Uh, some people say C++ doesn't have do notation. It does. <laughs> and alternative. Basically the same idea. We, the return type is a variant of either of the results. And we try to parse the first one. If that doesn't work, we return the result of the second one. If the second one also doesn't work, well, we just doesn't return. We just don't return. We just throw stuff. So that is basically all that I have on my slides. Uh, the first thing here is the build system thingy. Uh, 20 points for knowing what the name comes from. <laughs> and the second thing is the language uh, the uh, uh, the parsing context was from. Uh, it's meant to be a 
programming language, so it has binary expressions that are supposed to work. And so, as I said, this is all I have on my slides. If you want to some, see some raw code, I can show it to you. Or if you have some questions. So, so how do you handle logging? Or if you get a broken expression, you stop there and you attempt to continue on ever? Uh, I'm, bail I'm bailing out. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably if I was writing a, a parser for C++, I would probably try to do something else later on. Uh, although not necessarily. Basically, every time I compile C++, I have the error limit set to one, <laughs> because all, all the rest is just garbage. You, you want the first one, otherwise it makes no sense. Uh, I have no uh, easy answer for how to recover from an error. Uh, I'm not experienced with it. Uh, and frankly, I don't know if it's always a good idea to try to that, do that. Like, it's a broken parse tree either way. So trying to parse it might be like nice for the user by telling him, hey, you forgot the semicolon here. But that's, that's easy enough, right? You just throw an exception that tells here, at this point in the file, I expected a semicolon and I got something else. Or here, I expected an expression and I got something else. This makes no sense. So I'm not doing anything anymore. Yes. So about your use of um, exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, very often that you should use exceptions, but um, for what they're for, basically for exceptional circumstances, and particularly in case of the uh, furtative um, thingy, um, it's not really um, exceptional, right? Uh, it's more like you use exceptions for, for flow of code. Uh, for, yeah, so, so the is, is there like, um, you mentioned other techniques, but none of them seem really good. So. Uh, so the concern is whether uh, whether uh, okay the concern is whether here I'm not trying to use exceptions for control flow I kind of am <laughs> trying to do that uh, but the thing is I, uh, I usually say do not use exceptions for something that is not an error but <laughs> Uh, depends on the grammar. So the idea here, is, uh, the comment was half of the time it, it will throw. Uh, the idea is to put the, uh, the, the branch that is more likely to be taken into the first function and the one that is maybe taken sometimes into the second one. And as I said, C++ kind of does have do notation. If we had do notation that isn't related to exceptions and is easy to use, oh yes, I would do that. But so far, it's kind of monadic, right? <laughs> Sorry, uh, it was supposed to be a category theory free talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, do you want to see some code? But do you, you, what? Yeah. That that has to be all. You have to be decided about it. Like. Uh, so I didn't talk much about lexers. So let's see some lexers. Uh, can you see it? All right. This is how I like stuff. There's probably better ways or different ways. 
So I basically have one big thing. It's a, it's a quite simple parser, right? Elixir. It's supposed to be simple. It's supposed to work pretty fast. So I have all these functions defined here. So I don't have to pass context around because I'm not going to do backtracking inside the Lexer much. Uh, it's basically the same idea. So here's the handling of, of positions, right? I always increment offset. I always increment column. I sometimes zero the column and increment the line. I could do like if else and uh, then put one here, but I don't think it's an optimization worth uh, the drop in readability. I can pick any amount of times. Uh, yeah, here I'm actually using standard distance and advanced, which is not a very good interface, putting it mildly. Uh, I generate token, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the position stuff. So it's a helper to make it nicer. Uh, then I have something that kind of implements a part of regular expressions engines. This checks whether uh, the next character is, the, is of a particular kind. And yeah, I skip white space and I do stuff. So this is, this is comments. If I detect a slash and another slash, then I know I'm in a comment. If I detect a star, then it's a bit a bit more complex, and I might actually have to throw from this. Uh, this is symbols. Uh, this is actually not needed right now in this project because I don't have two character symbols. So uh, this is not my idea. I, I stole it from someone else, but I find it quite nice. So you have uh, maps of from characters into token types. And if you have symbols that have three characters, you have a symbols free map that is a map into a map into a map, which might sometimes hurt performance, I guess, but is, uh, except for this part, <laughs> It's very nice. It's very easy to define uh, more operators. And if it's just a single one, then that's easy enough. Uh, OK, here's the parsing of strings. There's some weirdness here. This substring is basically to consume the last, uh, the closing uh, quotes, but not put them into the token. Uh, otherwise, it's an identifier. And otherwise, it's nothing, so we can just throw something. This should be a concrete exception type, but whatever. It's still a work in progress. There, there can be weird things in the code. So uh, let's maybe see something slightly more interesting than this. Uh, mm, spoiler. So, uh, oh, that's wrong. So this is vapor. It's a, it's vapor because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, so this is a simple program in vapor, and this basically parses it. There is some commented out attempts to analyze it, but that's not done yet. So this syntax is quite simple, I think. You have functions, uh, you have lambdas, uh, you can use this as the return value of the function instead of writing a block that says return this. Uh, this is kind of a test case for the parser. So I have operators that are not to be parsed from left to right. I have to do something slightly more uh, complex with them. Oh, what did I do? Oh, 
what did that what did I do? Oh. Uh, here's how I do it. It's not a very nice code, but it does what it's supposed to. Oh, right. Uh, full screen windows. React slightly slowly for some reason. Can you see it? Okay. So this is the part that basically does the binary operator thing. Uh, at this point we have parsed an expression. So if the next token is a binary operator And some other stuff about some specific contexts where it's slightly different. It's not, this grammar I d isn't strictly LL. It has some weird, well, it might be LL star, but it has some weirdness in it. But it's a weirdness that could be implemented nicely in the parser. So I, I like the idea that when you're implementing a parser and it it's very simple to do stuff in it. You are doing the right thing. And your grammar is not broken. So we are verifying both the parser and the grammar at the same time. That's my point of view on this. So here, here I use the operator stack, so I check the last operator on the stack. I compare the, uh, I compare the precedences. So, I basically recurs inside binary, binary expression, which is, which is going to recurse into this, uh, and move in the thing that I'm working with inside. So the idea is that sometimes we are going to generate an expression from here. But sometimes it's going to be, a, to be a binary expression that should contain the expression that we parsed up above. There might be a better way to do it, but this works, so I like this. So yeah, the, this is again is some stuff that deals with positions. Visit basically visits this variant. It's an older code, doesn't use fmap yet. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything particularly interesting in around here. There's some weirdness here, like mapping from one break brace to the other. This is a postfix expression, which is basically the same thing as postfix expression is in C++. You can have a function call, you can have an uh, indexing operator access, and it just it grabs grabs the thing that's next. So it parses an expression, uh, then it grabs the next thing checks what's the type, saves it, and parses expressions, and then closes it. Yes? What do you actually do in this? Are you generating What I'm doing with the AST, I'm not doing anything right now with the AST. Uh, uh, Yes, so you could. Yeah, uh, not really. So what you see, uh, what you saw uh, over here, was basically the effect of parsing that simple program that had one lambda and one function inside. 
and this is the lexing part. This is the program again. This is the result of the lexer, and uh, this is the AST. So expression list and then expression because otherwise it wouldn't make sense in an, in any way because there would be a deep left recursion. Uh, so again, binary expression, expression, binary expression. So we can see that it works correctly. So we have a, uh, here's the addition. So here we have the binary expression, the first multiplication. Here we have the second one. I, uh, the thing I want to do with it is, I, I don't want to run on FEM. I, I will probably end up generating uh, maybe a lot of VMIR, maybe C++ to be compatible to an extent, or to or to avoid having to instantiate all the all the templates that I will have in the language. I don't know yet. Uh, there is a lot of things that have to be done for this work, and visitate. Like, like parsing is the easiest part of all of this. It's the simplest one, it's the most general one because most of the time you will do this basically the same thing. You will either use a parser generator or just write a recursive descent parser, parser that does the right thing. But otherwise when you go to the analysis of the AST of annotating it, it's a whole different story. Okay, thank you.